Hey folks, uh, uh, good morning, good day all. I'm the Adjutant General for Colorado, Major General Mike Lowe. With me in the room, I have uh, Command Sergeant Major Bill Woods, our senior enlisted leader. Uh, he's off camera, obviously uh, doing social distancing, and Lieutenant Katie Lee. Uh, thanks for joining me on a second Facebook uh, Live Town Hall discussing our war on COVID-19. Today I've asked a few of our team members to tell us a little bit about how they have supported our partners in the fight against COVID. First, I have Major Jason Reed. He's our Unified Command Center Liaison Officer. Jason is a career military police officer with multiple deployments, including his last one where he was the Camp Commandant at Guantanamo Bay. Day to day, he is our J39, responsible for all interagency partnerships. And he's really been doing that for the last two and a half years. So now he gets to, um, he gets to operationalize all those relationships as our UCCLNO. Jason, over to you. Hey, thanks everybody. And I wanna give a special shout out to all of our uh, soldiers out there uh, on mission. Um, it's definitely a great honor to, to be able to do this. And uh, as Tag said, I, um, I'm the Unified Command Center Liaison Officer and I've been embedded off-site uh, for about 60 days now with my primary primary duties working closely with our partners and our partners have are, are at the national level with FEMA at the state level with the uh, Department of Homeland Security Emergency Management the Colorado uh, Department of uh, Health and Environment and our uh, emergency support functions just to name a few um, as the liaison officer I help shape National Guard specifically Colorado National Guard capabilities and capacities that will give our uh, partners that right fit of what they're looking for. So whether it's uh, sheltering or COVID testing, identifying and helping to shape that for our partners. You know, I've had this enduring relationship with our partners, so the transition has been pretty seamless. Um, and I really attribute those uh, successes to working closely with all of them over the last two and a half years. You know, whether it's been actual exercises, uh, command post exercises, and even being activated, whether it was a fire or flood, uh, that common denominator has been that enduring relationship um, across the board. And I understand and we all know that this uh, COVID-19 response is, and in many of us will say it is, we're building the airplane in flight. How do we respond? But our, the way we do our business and that enduring partnership has really been the same. We still plan and we still coordinate two, do, two common denominators that have not changed in this uh, new epidemic. So again, a special shout out to every one of you guys that's been activated, thanks. Hey Jason, thanks. Thank you for your outstanding work. I know in the last uh, town hall I talked about the first person to uh, to go over to the Unified Command Center, and that was Jason Reed. So he reported within uh, I, I'll call it minutes, but it was less than a couple hours, uh, ready to go. Uh, for the first three weeks, he uh, he worked there uninterrupted, no days off, no anything. Got everything standing up in the crisis action phase. So Jason, thanks from uh, from all of us, and we're very proud. And thanks for sticking with us, because you'll get all the hard questions as they come up. Hey, next yes, we'll sir. hear from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kara McClain. Kara is our uh, full-time Army National Guard Deputy State Surgeon and a Medical Services Corps Officer. She has some significant domestic operation experience. She served in the Joint Staff on multiple times, and she's also been mobilized and deployed with the Army to including service in the 1st Striker Brigade. Um, Kara was also instrumental and our stand-up of our partnership with the Israeli Home Front Command. So she's no stranger to these partnerships. And uh, I currently handpicked her to be, uh, on the, to be the task force commander for our crisis cabinet advisory team, as well as serving in, in one of the governor's innovative response teams. So Kara, over to you. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Yes, sir. Thank you for that introduction. Um, so good morning, all. Um, thank you for what you're doing out there. We appreciate your support. We certainly appreciate the response to the community. Um, for all the healthcare workers out there, you're on the front lines. And again, we appreciate what you're doing. During COVID-19 response, um, I have had the opportunity to serve in support of the state's innovative response team, as well as a member of the Colorado National Guard's Joint Medical Planning Group, um, and briefly as a medical planner in support of the Unified Command Center. Early in the response, Lieutenant Colonel McKelvey and I had a unique and incredible opportunity serve in support of uh, the governor's office as a staff augmentation. And then we transitioned from that role into the state's innovative response team. That team is embedded in the Unified Command Center and it's comprised of um, members of, of the community, um, members from the private sector, state employees, um, and really what we're trying to get after there are um, creative solutions 
and out of the box application to some of the problems that COVID-19 has presented to the community. Um, so that's been an incredible experience. As well, the Joint Medical Planning Group is comprised of both Army and Air surgeons, as well as the deputy surgeons, some additional medical providers, and then uh, medical planners. And that group established very early in the response as well at the request of Joint Task Force Centennial. We worked quickly to establish our team, um, synthesize all of the information that was coming from numerous sources so that we could speak with a unified voice um, in providing medical guidance and recommendations to senior leaders, the service components, and then provide a response to any requests for information from the field. Um, I'm honored to be here today. As members of the Colorado National Guard, we stand ready to answer the call. Uh, this has been challenging and humbling, but I have been honored to, to serve in this capacity. Um, sir, thank you for the opportunity to address some of these aspects of our response this morning. Great, thank Kara. You. And also, uh, as we get to the question and answer period, we'll have you uh, take some of the tougher questions. Hey, Kara, thanks, thanks for your continued hard work and, of course, uh, uh, meaningful, very meaningful work on behalf of Colorado. Um, and on behalf of that, thank you for your outstanding service. Hey, folks, we've been trying to pass on as much information as we can. Obviously, the Colorado National Guard, through your leadership and chain of command, through uh, the Joint Task Force Centennial, um, we've been out there to answer your questions during our war on COVID-19. Um, and, as, and as things develop over the next several months, please communicate, 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 both up, down, and sideways in your chain of command. That'll help all of us get through this. First, I want to let you know there's nothing more imperative to us as we've been doing this than your family's health and your health. We can't do it without you. The Colorado National Guard has brought senior staff members from all of our components and uh, to form what, uh, what I've called Task Force Next, or the next phase as we go through this COVID. Task Force Next is, is charged with plotting our course towards a new normal in the future. Uh, we follow the state's guidance, and following that state's guidance, we've in implemented, implemented sorry, a four-phase approach uh, in response to COVID-19. The first phase we're, we've already gone through. It was our initial response to COVID-19, or the crisis action phase. This included enforcing social distancing practices, telecommuting as much as possible, and limiting trips that are only deemed essential, such as obviously going to the grocery store and a doctor's appointments. It also meant ensuring our 24-7 homeland defense missions and posturing the guard to support the whole of government approach, both as Kara and Jason explained, to, uh, to fight uh, this COVID-19. And uh, currently today, there are 444 Colorado National Guard members on duty just fighting COVID-19. Nationally, over 83,000 National Guard members are engaged not only in COVID-19, but also in homeland defense missions and also mobilized for overseas operations. That's almost 20% of the National Guard. 45,000 of those are engaged in COVID-19 operations throughout the United States. Um, as we start phase two operations, and that's really known as the transition phase, and it essentially began right now. Um, it began this past Monday as Governor Polis issued, uh, went from the stay at home order to the safer at home executive order. And so we'll continue our COVID response operations, but also transition to this new phase. For us, this phase will last around three months until August. And I just get, and I put that timeline in there because after three months, I figure we can get back to what we'll call the, the next round or the new normal operations. It's, uh, it's gonna have us slowly going back to reopening up training and businesses in a controlled manner. While we actively work on social distancing and continuing our safe and expanded hygiene protocols. We'll come back to work in a gradual, careful way, both during the week and at drill, and of course, to conduct annual training to regain our readiness. At phase three, we'll move into our sustained vigilance phase. And this is one that's gonna be the longest. So for sustained vigilance, we'll, be, uh, we'll start to engage in collective training, uh, go back to schools, and also, uh, um, engage in our state partnership programs and those training venues. This phase is the new normal phase of sustained vigilance and it, and it will last the longest. We'll do our best to close the year out on a high note with training and outreach to our partners. We'll stay in this phase for the foreseeable future and we'll watch closely for continued outbreaks and flare-ups. We will also look at the potential of moving back into transition phases 
or even crisis action as the virus and its spread can dictate those changes, as we've seen. We will incorporate the many lessons learned if we have to go that route. And I thank you for your willingness to help and of course your understanding and flexibility. At some point in the future, we'll be happy to see increased testing and even potentially a vaccine. And that will take us to our phase four, which is essentially back to normal. So that's the four phases that one we've gone through and the three new ones that we'll get to. During these unprecedented times, the Colorado National Guard has adapted and will continually adapt and modify our, our training to keep our forces ready and prepared. As just one example, and this is really a perfect example on how we've adapted in this new environment. Um, the Army basic leadership course continues on, okay? And our thanks really goes out um, to this individual's resourcefulness and forward thinking. So it was Command Sergeant Major Jeff Essman. Command Sergeant Major Essman is the Commandant of the Basic Leadership Course at our Regional Training Institute, or RTI, in Fort Carson. Along with his cadre, he runs a 22-day training course, normally composed of 220 students. As a result of COVID-19, we have been forced to pause in-person training. Command Sergeant Major Essman was undeterred he petitioned the Army to allow our RTI to conduct the first virtual-based multi-component basic leaders course. Thanks to his ingenuity, the course is able to continue onwards, providing these soldiers with key developmental opportunities. We need a big, we need to give Command Sergeant Major Jeff Esmond a big thank you because he was able to make a difference for our United States Army and our National Guard. Uh, as that, your leaders in the Colorado Army and Air National Guard are ready to get back to training and improving readiness and, and our business of the military. I appreciate how innovative our leaders have been with converting into virtual drills, generating phased and alternate schedules, and configure, configuring our facilities to support social distancing protocols. You can trust your leadership will manage our return to maintenance, in-person work, and drill weekends safely, and that our Joint Medical Planning Group has assessed our plans and made recommendations focused on your success. As we move through our phased operations, I'd ask you to remember that we are all in this together and that we will get through this together. And now um, you've submitted a bunch of uh, questions to us, so we'll take uh, the first question. Lieutenant Lee, what do you got? If guidance can be given to active duty and Army Reserve regarding this specific PCS move, why can't guidance be provided to National Guard soldiers? Okay, um, recently the Secretary uh, of Defense extended the depart department-wide stop movement order, or extended it until uh, the end of June, so 30 June. However, he did, he did say to us, and been on a couple of calls with the Secretary of Defense, he did say to us that he would review that policy uh, every um, every 15 days or so. So, although not every National Guard order falls under this provisions, it's guidance that I believe we're wise to follow. Um, due to the command and control of our governor and the role that our governors play in securing our readiness and training, the National Guard can set its own policy. And uh, for the whole of, uh, of uh, the Department of Defense, general officers at certain levels across the military have been delegated the authority to make very limited exceptions to the stop, stop movement order. We in the Guard must make decisions carefully, recognizing that our soldiers and airmen are looking to plan for their future and future of their families. For Colorado, I have delegated the authority for PCS moves to the first general officer in your chain of command. So Generals Sherman, Dunstan, and Paul have that authority. Um, so please work your specific issue up your chain of command, and it, especially if you need an exception. In the state, home showings and real estate transactions have started back up, so those things are ongoing. We're committed to hearing your concerns and making an informed decision on uh, why you need to uh, move or PCS during this time, um, and so we're absolutely open to making that happen. Thanks for your understanding and patience in that. All right, Lieutenant Lee, question two. Due to many soldiers losing the opportunity to complete their scheduled annual training, is there any possibility that National Guard Bureau will allow National Guard soldiers to receive the retirement points normally earned for 
AT without performing the duty? Uh, the short answer is probably not. I, I don't see them getting giving credit for, uh, for not being there or not working. Um, our leaders are currently working on plans to reschedule annual training across our force, including maximum flexibility for completing that training. So the leaders, we've empowered the leaders to make those decisions. Some of our units will be able to conduct AT exactly when and where they originally planned. Others will alter the location of AT. Still others may conduct their annual training across several separate days or weeks during the remainder of the fiscal year. So we've given them the absolute flexibility to do this. We need to do our best, and, I, and this is for all of us, to re-engage in annual training for a variety of reasons. The most important is rebuilding and sustaining our readiness. Right now, there are no policy changes that I, have, that I am aware of in the works uh, to actually answer your question. I'd ask that you stay in contact with your chain of command to get the best and most timely an answers. And remember, I need each and every one of you to stay engaged, stay ready, stay in communication, and most of all, stay healthy. So thanks for that, but uh, yep, annual training will go. And it looks like question three. For the soldiers currently activated working on a task force, would this count towards their annual training? And would there be testing before completion of orders? All right, um, so we'll get another uh, annual training question. I'll address that one here in a second. Um, and so I'll answer them in reversed order. With regards to will there be testing at the end of your service on a task force mission? Uh, the answer is, is pretty simple, it depends. It depends on whether, whether or not you were in a high risk mission set or if we have any reason to believe you need to be tested. We're staying in alignment with the state guidance um, and also their overall testing and tracing strategy. Um, we don't want to take up testing resources if it isn't required. Having said that, we've also, um, we started out on the testing regime for this at around 140, 150 tests per day. We've now ramped that up to, uh, recently we had over 4,400 tests in one day. So we have ramped that up and we're gonna continue to ramp that up. I think right now in the state, we're looking at uh, trying to do uh, tests in all 64 counties and ramp it up to at least 10,000, the ability to conduct 10,000 tests a day. And CARA probably has more thing on, things on that. So um, uh, since, since we have done that and we have looked at the high risk missions, we've been very successful with testing task force team members based on COVID response, COVID positive interactions and tracing. So if you have a concern and you need, and you feel like you need to be tested in particular, please work through your task force commander who will pass that information up to the joint staff and task force Centennial for action. Additionally, what we have done for every member that is in that high risk uh, um, population of, of uh, being in close proximity to COVID positive uh, people and COVID exposure is build in a 14 day quarantine period before you come off orders, in addition to the leave benefits that you have accrued and earned. That does match current DOD guidance and it's also the right things for us to do. So uh, additionally, if you're in a high risk situation at home where you're caring for a loved one that's in those high risk categories, we'll also get you a place to stay. So, so you're not going back home to potentially infect that member. Uh, so before you get off orders, 14 day quarantine plus leave if you're in those high risk situations, plus we'll find you a proper place to stay to do that quarantine. And again, my first priority since the beginning is your safety of both you and your family members. Um, this is one way that we can do it. Um, regarding the other part of your question on COVID-19 response and whether it counts uh, for annual training. Your service, uh, and this goes back to a little bit of uh, title, uh, of US code, but Title 32502F of US code, the orders that you're on right now, which is normal training status, does count your days of service towards a good um, year and also retirement credit. As far as that, as can that be allowed for annual training is really up to your chain of command. So we've delegated this down to your leaders. That level of, of decision making is best left to your commander and your command team. COVID-19 responses operations, obviously, and obviously annual training is just that, training we need to maintain our readiness. But, I, but as, a, as mostly a, a, a M-Day uh, um, participant in the National Guard, I understand your family and your employers want you back. And that COVID was something that was unplanned. Um, so if you need that, 
please get with your, uh, with your commanders and your command team. Um, from my standpoint, and probably from your commander's standpoint, what they'll tell you is we need your full participation in annual training events this year to get after the readiness gaps that have been created by our COVID-19 pandemic and to ensure our war fighting readiness. So I ask that each of you consider that, not only volunteering for the operation, but also for, uh, for annual training to get after and fill those readiness gaps and uh, to ensure, uh, secure our national defense and the readiness to conduct those missions. All right, um, thanks for those, uh, those questions that came to us ahead of time. Now we'll, uh, we'll open it up to uh, Facebook floor and see uh, who has some. Lieutenant Lee, you got any? Not yet, but people are typing. Okay, so we got some people typing. So short briefing today, Matt, and of course you can ask me questions, but uh, the tough ones I'll, uh, I'll defer to, uh, to Sergeant Major. Who us, sir? <laughs> <laughs> or Colonel McLean or, or Major Reed. And if there's not that many questions, then this makes it an easy thing. <laughs> Sounds good. With that, Major Reed, what's on your uh, agenda for this week? You know, uh, we've got a pretty established battle rhythm going on at the UCC. So, again, that coordination piece with all of our partners, um, you know, really starting at that local level, working at that regional level, working closely at that state level. Um, you know, any of these missions that we, we take on, you know, getting the locals involved, uh, that's been a best practice. So, not just specific to, you know, like, for instance, the city of Greeley, getting their emergency manager involved, getting their... Uh, county emergency manager involved, getting their public health uh, people involved. So really a lot of that backwards coordination at that low level and then bringing in like a regional field manager out of the DHSCM and then those state assets. Just so like we'd already discussed that whole of community approach to doing all of these operations so that we're embedded and we're the right fit there. So that, that takes up a lot of my time. And I, just like everybody else hitting those meetings, but during those meetings, really planning, coordinating, developing uh, mission analysis, course of actions in which we could uh, best utilize the, the National Guard. And at times, you know, the National Guard might not be that best best asset. So having those, you know, those hard discussions is, is takes up a lot of my time. Got it. Yeah, this last week, uh, Sergeant Major and I went out uh, to, to look at two things and bring in a little bit of the whole of government. Our first trip was uh, to the alternate care facilities in Pueblo, uh, out to Grand Junction and then Westminster. And it was, uh, and it was bringing uh, public health in there, public safety, um, off, Office of Economic Development, um, um, public administration, how we're gonna, how we're gonna start uh, state government back up. So that was the first trip that we took. And, and you're right, it's been an amazing partnership at the local level. And, uh, and then the second one was going out to see some of our task force uh, emergency operations center members. And so it was uh, visiting counties um, Ure County, Teller County, and Montezuma County down in the far southwest of our state. And Montezuma, of course, has, uh, has uh, our Ute uh, tribes, our Southern Utes and our uh, um, uh, Mountain Ute tribes down there and, uh, and their integration and work with them. But it was interesting to see at the local level, uh, the county um, commissioners, some uh, mayors of the smaller communities, and then the public health, county public health, coming together with the uh, county emergency manager, normally the sheriff or somebody from the sheriff's office in order to, uh, in order to figure out how the counties are gonna handle it at a local level. So, and then of course, I, I keep telling them the way, the way it's done is if you have a need, please go to the county EOCs and then, and then uh, up to the uh, UCC at the, at the state level and uh, to get those sourced. So, yeah, thanks. Kara, how about you? What do you got on, on tap for this week or, or the joint medical planning group? Sir, you know, as Major Reed explained it, it's almost um, a daily response within a response. Um, and so how we navigate the request of the um, partners that we're supporting, and then also looking at from a service component standpoint, how do we navigate the requirements to onboard and offboard soldiers from the 502F status? So um, constantly reviewing what the requirement is and then working to support all of those entities um, as they require. On the um, state side, looking at, you know, as we discussed briefly and you mentioned previously, um, looking at identifying testing sites in all of the counties. So I'm working to support that. 
Um, but again, kind of a response within a response and just addressing the requirements as they come each day. Yeah, when the joint medical planning group stood up and, and we were looking at how to respond to this, um, how much uh, interaction, how much has changed since day one to now? I think, um, I think it's been pretty consistent, honestly, from the beginning. We, we collaborated. Um, we had already um, established a relationship previously between both the Army and the Air surgeons and deputy surgeons. Um, I work closely with the medical planner on the Air side as well. And so it was just another opportunity to really reinforce that relationship and then take it to the next level so that we can provide that um, unified voice to you and the other senior leaders, sir. Okay. Hey, thanks. Thanks for that. Yes, sir. Lee, go ahead. Get a question. So with the slow move back to normal, what do you see for the movement back to military standards such as haircuts? <laughs> oh, you mean like mine right now that has been uh, long? Well, I'll tell you, uh, right now in Douglas County, we're going to open up uh, um, personal care services on, uh, on Friday. My haircut appointment is at 9.15. I got the first one. So, so um, I, I see that our move back as we open up will be back to normal standards. Thanks. Hey, sir, I've got no problem with the haircut standards. Um, I save $15 every two weeks by doing my own. So if anybody is uh, looking a little bit shaggy on the size, give me a shout, and uh, I'll give you the uh, the BIC 101 special. Free yeah. Store. yeah, Jason, I love it. Thanks. Yeah, you know what? Um, um, I was talking to the Sergeant Major who gives me a little grief every day. It, and I go, you know what, Sergeant Major, it has been 40 years since I was 17 years old when I've had a hair this long. So, hey, as the old guy in the room, I'm, I'm kind of enjoying it, to tell you the truth. <laughs> go ahead, Lieutenant Lee. So it's been told on the science side of the virus that there are new updates on the life of it coming. Last heard, it dies faster in hot climates and then lives on in the strong cold weather. What are our options to adapting to this if it, if it dies down? and then comes back again next year. Yeah, um, the, way, the way I've explained this, I said this is like a boxing match. We're in round one. Round one is, hey, let's get through this. Um, round two will be, um, and I call it the hot spots. Round three could be the longest round, uh, which is, and so round two is, is uh, it emerges in a hot spot, like it has in some of our uh, congregate facilities, our long-term care facilities, like it has up in, um, in our food supplies, um, the high density uh, workplaces like uh, meat packing and doing meat processing and packing. And so how do we handle that? We handle that with small teams that go in there to help that out. We help it in uh, living centers by, um, uh, there's three teams uh, out of uh, HICPUF um, and human services and public safety uh, that'll go in there and uh, to include our testing support folks that'll go in there and test people to see how they're doing that. So those are, those are small little isolated incidents. And, uh, and hopefully we'll tamp those down and do that. If it comes back strong, kind of like a flu season, and that's what everyone's been talking about, is as we get to what normally would be a flu season as it comes back, the first thing we're gonna have to do, and that's why we're ramping it up so quickly, is test. Because that'll be the first indications. So if I'm gonna go in for what seems like a flu, could also be COVID or, or something not even known, then, uh, then it's to get that testing done accurately. And so everything that the state's done so far, and Kara, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, has been to get the most accurate testing and to ramp up the testing capability very quickly. So that's what, that's what we've been doing on that. As that comes about, that is when we look at um, all the things that are going on around the state and in that particular county and where that, are, that uh, happens. And do we need to go back to transition either into uh, the crisis action phase, or actually in the transition phase. So where, where we would start taking actions in order to stop that. And those actions for, uh, for the state range everything from, again, uh, shutting down schools to shutting down businesses. But again, we're gonna try to take a graduated approach. And then everything that we've learned in the first phase of the crisis action to this phase, and as more and more studies come out, because science, um, We've seen studies that are going to come out of uh, uh, the Colorado uh, medical systems. We've seen studies that uh, both the Air Force and Army have initiated, so our Department of Defense has initiated studies, and the overseas studies and the lessons we can learn, we'll take all that together to figure out our next plan of attack. Hopefully that makes sense. Care anything to add on that one? 
No, sorry, I think you would address that accurately. Thanks. Is there a test that the full-time force can take to see if we have had this before or have it now, or is there one coming out in the near future? Um, right now, the Department of Defense is looking at the, um, at, uh, the antibody testing. And so as a whole, we've been, uh, we've been looking at how um, we scale up antibody testing. And I'm gonna, I think CARE has probably been on the front lines of this more than I have, but I know that the state has been, uh, has been looking at a couple things. CARE, do you wanna address this? Sure, I think um, you know, really what the state is looking at is identifying a test much like the other test um, that is appropriate and um, has some certainty behind it with specificity as well as sensitivity. Um, and so making sure again that we're, we're purchasing and sending out the, the tests that are going to come back with the most accuracy. So not necessarily um, today will there be tests available for, for the full-time um, unit support or or the rest of the organization but i think eventually just like the rest of the state we will get there so it was about a uh, week and a half ago two weeks ago was on a call uh, all the adjunct generals were with the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff general milley and general milley said to us hey i think the key to this is getting that antibody test out now having said that our joint medical planning group and and our doctors uh, some of them who are specialized in infectious diseases have told us that um, it's, not on, it's not certain if you have the antibodies that you're actually immune to the disease. Again, that takes studies. Um, I know uh, the CDC, WHO, Department of Defense, they're all looking at what that can mean. And so we'll know um, if it means that we have some sort of immunity to it or not. So don't think of it as a panacea. Um, I, I really want you okay, to continue to wear masks to continue on with, uh, with the proper hygiene and san sanitation. And if you're sick, uh, if you got a fever, if you have any of those uh, signs or symptoms, um, that you stay at home and you get the proper medical treatment and care before you come into the workplace or do that stuff. Uh, long term, I think it's there right now. Um, it hasn't been able to scale up to the appropriate level. Anything else? How are our state partners doing in this? And is there anything that we can do in order to help them? Um, great questions on state partnership. So in Jordan right, right now, they've been on complete lockdown. Uh, about two weeks ago, we talked to, uh, talked to our folks over in Jordan, which includes, uh, we have an MPEP F-16 pilot flying F-16s with them. Obviously we have the bilateral affairs officer, and then we have the senior enlisted leader of the MAPJ. So uh, between those three folks, uh, they've told us about, uh, almost, uh, it's, it's essentially a stay at home order. And uh, only movements are allowed are for official business. So the folks going into an embassy and that. The military operations uh, at the main bases over there, Department of Defense, and also at some of the other garrisons like Al Tomf and Jordan are continuing on, again, with severe limitations on, on, how, we, uh, on how we interact because of COVID. Because we don't wanna be the, the uh, spread, we don't wanna be the cause of spread of this disease. So Jordan's been on, on a pretty uh, tough lockdown. Ramadan's coming up, which will, which will further um, do that. And so um, they're starting to slowly come back. What we've looked at in Jordan is when that should open up. And it's really maybe the last quarter of this year. They've done a very good job of containment and testing. So at, as uh, Jordan has done. And so what we're, what we're looking at is opening up the primary um, uh, means for training with them on what we do in the future. Which, uh, which has gone on about uh, F-16 maintenance and operations, um, uh, helicopter, UH-60 maintenance and operations, um, our ditcher mission for the Suburn operations, which of course, I have most of my uh, Suburn force engaged right now in COVID support, so trying to get them done has been, uh, has been difficult. In Slovenia, uh, know exactly what, what's been going on there because that, that's been an interesting one because uh, Sergeant Major and I and the team were actually over there when this started. So we saw Slovenia um, uh, really protect their borders, protect their borders to the south and protect their borders to the west with Italy where the uh, hotspots were coming in from, so they shut down their borders. Then they did essentially the same thing, which is a uh, shelter in place and shelter at home. They've started to open that up uh, now, and then UCOM has asked us to look at our engagements and try to make, uh, try to still engage both uh, uh, virtually as we can and also in person as we can towards the end of the year. 
So we'll open up some of those uh, lines of engagement that we've had in the past with, uh, with uh, both Slovenia and Jordan as they move through this. And um, yeah, they've been going through the same thing we have and, uh, and also been able to, uh, to fight this off. So as long as uh, their borders start to open up, ours will too. The biggest thing I'm concerned about is, is if there's a, a quarantine requirement before we travel because I, or once we get into a new location, how that works out because we have uh, members that are stuck down right now at Fort Bliss who've been on a, uh, what I'll call a perpetual quarantine because of the stop movement or order to the theater. So 39 uh, Army soldiers at Fort Bliss right now, they're essentially stuck in their room. Um, doing some individual training and doing that stuff and keeping connected much like we are via Zoom and some other things, but, uh, but getting that one lifted and getting those folks uh, moving is uh, important to me. Do you have a date or time frame for when we will be able to return to our offices in the armories? Yep, um, we, we started it right now. So it's, uh, the offices in the armories have, have started to open up. We're looking at, um, uh, for state employees uh, next Monday, but we'll also follow the, uh, the direction of, uh, of local health officials. So if the county is shut down and still shut down, we are gonna follow those directions. But for, uh, for the armories and opening up, uh, remember the military wasn't excluded. We, we shut this down basically in order to get a handle on the response and what we'll need to in order to provide you a safe environment so that when you come into an armory that you are uh, going to maintain that safety and that health. Uh, some of the uh, policies in place are to clean your workstation before work and after work. It's to monitor your own uh, self-assessment and also get uh, assessed by different folks. So like the Joint Force Headquarters, because there's a large group that come here uh, routinely. We have um, temperature monitors. Uh, we also have, uh, who's a Master Sergeant? That's, that's running our mayor right now? Phillips, sir. Yeah, so Master Sergeant Phillips is essentially the mayor of the Joint Force Headquarters campus right now. So he's, he's uh, making sure that everything is, uh, is provided and that we're making a, a safe environment for folks. So folks can start coming back to work. I'll ask that you, uh, that you look at uh, your workspace for that social distancing. I'll ask that if you can telework, that we continue to, uh, to look at uh, doing that and work with your supervisors and command team in order to, to make sure that that telework uh, uh, is, uh, is working. And then you limit your exposure and exposure to others by, uh, by limiting your time in here, if at all possible. I know that's tough for some of our maintenance. Okay, go ahead. So, uh, sir, I had a, uh, a text question come in from a retiree. I uh, yeah. wanted you to discuss the status of our forces that are deployed, not just the ones that are working in our state partner countries. Okay, uh, deployed forces right now are continuing on with their, uh, with their um, deployments. Some of them have, um, have essentially been locked down in place. So they've been extended, their deployments have been extended. We have uh, approximately 16 airmen right now uh, deployed overseas in CENTCOM and about 246 Army soldiers in some uh, MOB and deployment. We did get back our, um, our Army Space Support Team. They just came back after a 14-day quarantine and then the DMOB process at Fort Hood, and then they finally returned to the state of Colorado. Not quite to the hero's welcome that they normally come back to. Um, basically, hey, get back in the state and go back home. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll welcome them at an appropriate time as more and more things uh, uh, open up. Um, we have folks engaged in combat operations in Afghanistan to, uh, to uh, uh, the UN mission at K4 and what's going on there. Um, so we do have folks deployed essentially around the world from combat operations to K4 missions and, uh, and we'll continue those operations and those missions. And those are ongoing. So, um, so those have not stopped during this time. Thanks for the question. So are travel restrictions for leave and going out of state still in place regarding the DOD travel ban? If so, how soon will they be able to leave the state for leave? Yep, um, they are in place except for, uh, and again, there's always exceptions to policy. So if you have an exception to policy, then uh, please get it up through your chain of command. Uh, in the state, the state guidance uh, from the governor has come down. You know, it's like uh, going out and uh, going to a state park or, or working out or doing that stuff. 
um, the state has said, hey, stay within 10 miles of your home of residence. And so we'll continue to do that. If you have a second home, if you have a need to go care for a loved one, if you have something like that, please get that up there. But those are, those are gonna be uh, in force. Um, the Secretary of Defense is looking, that, uh, looking uh, at that every two weeks. So, uh, so he's, he's, uh, he's gonna look at trying to move that one way or another from the 30 June date right now, the restricted movement. And of course, the first general officer in your chain of command can approve it. So if you have a problem, please get it through your chain of command up there quickly and we'll get it addressed. Because I know some people uh, need to go places and do that. So thanks. And that's all the questions we have. Okay. Kara, any final uh, thoughts from you? No, sir. Again, I just appreciate the opportunity to address some of our different aspects of support today and uh, to spend some time with the group. Thank you, okay. sir. No, thank you. Jason? No, I'd just like to thank all the service members that are out there um, doing what they're doing. Also, our uh, you know private and public sector people. This is a this is a one uh, one team approach. We can't do it by ourselves. We need all those responders and all those different capabilities doing what they're doing. And if you're not in the fight, listening to those like stay at home um, type orders, so we can get through this. But uh, extremely proud of everybody out there and proud to be part of the team. Ah, uh, thanks, Jason. Sergeant Major. No, that's good. Good job, sir. And I saw that. Uh, Appreciate that. That Colonel M McLean finally smiled. <laughs> Lieutenant Lee, anything? No, sir. I think you okay. covered it all. Awesome. Hey, folks, uh, that's really all we have time for today. Um, thank you very much. Please continue your communications. I, I can't tell you enough. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Uh, thanks for joining all of us today on this call. Uh, we'll see uh, how it goes in the future if we continue these. Um, I, both the Sergeant Major and I, look forward to seeing you all in action. We love that, whether it's annual training, whether it's out there in COVID response, it's fun to get out and, uh, and see everyone. Till then, stay ready, stay safe, wash your hands, cover your face, and keep a safe distance from everybody. Always ready, always there, your Colorado National Guard. Thank you very much. <laughs>